All right, so sensory perception, this is chapter 31, along with pain management, which is chapter 32. So first, let's meet our patient, Richard. He's a 90-year-old male um, who has been a resident at a skilled nursing facility for 10 years. He has no visitors. He never leaves his room, has no TV or radio in his room, and no longer speaks. He does not respond to verbal or tactile stimulation. He lies in the bed in a fetal position. When staff members try to move him, he moans and howls. So keep in mind of Richard, we're going to be going back to him a couple times throughout this lecture. And let's talk about vision, hearing, taste, smell, touch. Those are all our sensories, right? Okay. So the senses. So they provide information about the internal environment, okay? what we have internally in our external environment. So also our senses allow us to respond to changes. Our senses help our body maintain homeostasis. It's necessary for our human growth and development. We need our senses. So stimulus. So stimulus is just the trigger that stimulates the receptor. This might be a sound, a light, it might be something you touch. Um, it all depends on what type of stimulant, okay, that is going and then it process, um, it processes it. Now, once it processes it and then it gives us the opportunity to do an action on it, okay? So let's continue. Reception. So this is part of the actual action. So we get the stimuli, okay, from the nerve endings, and then we go through the receptors. So breaking down the receptors again, thermal receptors is through the skin and determines our temperature. So that's the prior perceptors is the skin, the muscles, okay, it allows us to sense the position of our body, okay. Then our photoreceptors. This helps with the detection of light, okay, with our retina. Then there's a couple of other receptors. So there's the, the mechanoreceptors, so that is within the skin. So the touch, okay, allows us to figure out the touch. So here's a question. So the components of the sensory, sensory experience. So again, perception, it's the ability to interpret the sensory impulses. Um, it's ability to give meaning uh, it could be affected by the location of the receptor, the number of the receptors, the frequency of the action potentials, and any changes in above. So responses and sensation. So there's factors affecting the response. There's the intensity of the stimulus. There's the contrasting of the stimuli, the adaptation of the stimuli, the previous experiences to that response. Um, requires people to be alert, okay? So these people need to be alert, they need to be receptive to the stimulation. So a couple of things with when the body gets the response is it has a choice. It has three different choices. One, the brain can either discard it, okay? Store it in memory, or it sends that message down through the motor pathways throughout the body depending on what the stimuli response needs to be. Okay, so factors affecting sensory function. Again, we talked about this in class, about age, stage of life, so developmental stage, cultures, illness can affect it, medications, stress, personality, possibly lifestyle. Um, some sensory alterations, so there's sensory deprivation. There's sensory overload, sensory deficits, uh, which can be impaired vision, hearing, taste, smell, uh, tactile perception, kinesthetic sense. So nursing interventions for common sensory alterations. So sensory deprivation, what is it? What is deprivation? So there's a sensory gap. What does that mean? What do you guys think that means? So with, there is a, how can I write, how can I say this? There is a sensory gap which causes when the external stimuli is deficient, the remaining stimuli such as diminished noises, um, maybe cold extremities, they kind of get concentrated on a lot more and that can cause that sensory. 
So this is causing the patient to be having a greater stimuli, okay, so greater level of distress because of this, because they're focused on those little, little things, um, than the actual stimulus. So for instance, let's say a patient who doesn't have their glasses, so that's sensory depri deprivation. So they're so fatuated or so like concentrated on how they can't see that everything else gets huge when the stimuli, the stimulus is very small. They just need to get their glasses. Um, focus is prevention. So preventing this is key. Uh, hearing needs. So when we have patients who have any sorts of supporting senses, I always ask them, do you wear glasses? Do you use hearing aids? Do you um, have impaired taste or anything? Because I need to know that. Um, so how can I help them? I'm gonna orientate them. Calendars can help, view of their environment, um, provide stimuli. So possibly when they are wearing those glasses, they got their glasses on, they're, they're the correct um, prescription, the correct strength. So regular contact, um, possibly touch, uh, television and radio, put that on, because then that helps as kind of like a little distractor as well, but they're in deprivation. They need more stimuli. Pet therapy is amazing, as long as they're not allergic or scared. This is so ideal for our clients. They really do enjoy this. Sensory overload. So sensory overload, they're getting too much stimulus, okay, too much. How to help them? We need to minimize their stimuli, so less light, noise, less television or radio, a calm tone, reduce any noxious or odors. They need to rest, and if they're really stressed, Okay, we need to teach them how to reduce that stress. All right, so let's continue. So clients who are visually impaired, I need to assess them first. Okay, do they wear glasses? How's the lighting? Um, do they wear sunglasses in the sunlight? Okay, do they use large prints to, uh, to read because they can't see the small print? Um, I also need to evaluate, okay, how do they perform their ADLs at home? Are they able to perform them independently? Do they have a hard time doing this? Um, how is their environment at home? Because if they're having a difficulty seeing, okay, so remember in lab, I had you guys put these blinders on, and then you guys navigate through the hallway, hopefully through the chairs and the tables. But if, the, if their home is so tight, okay, are they able to be safe? In that environment or do they have large rooms do they have a large square footage of home um, and if they're completely completely blind do they need a seeing dog now let's go to your ATI book your ATI book brings breaks it really down nicely along with your your FA Davis book uh, let's look at the specific interventions what we're going to do for impaired vision clients when you walk into the room how are you going to introduce yourself okay they're visually impaired Hi, my name is Caitlin. I'm going to be your nurse today. How are you? Kate, okay, acknowledge that you're coming into the room. Always identify yourself at all times. Now, every time that you come into a patient's room, even if you've been there all day, you have to confirm their name and date of birth. Look at their armband. Okay. Hi, my name is Caitlin. I'm going to be your nurse today. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Can you tell me your name and date of birth? They tell you your name and date, their name and date of birth. And then can I look at your armband? You look at the armband and you're identifying that it's correct. So these clients have a vision impairment. So they may be completely blind or they may be partially. So if they are partially, stay within their vision. So sit in front of them. Um, if, they have, if they have peripheral vision loss, make sure you're out of those, okay? Because they're not gonna be able to see you. So make sure you're within their vision. Now, these clients can't really see. Okay, we've talked about this multiple times. Now, when I'm going in the room, I'm always gonna do a general survey. See how 216 kind of comes in here? I'm assessing them. If they need assistance on changing, kind of let them know. Maybe they can't see that after lunch, they spilled a little. I don't think they're leaving it for like a later snack. Um, also, always let them know what you're doing. So I'm going to be just looking at your armband. I'm going to be touching your right arm. Let them know what you're doing in your assessment. Let them know when you're going to touch them, okay, and why you're touching them. 
Um, if you're moving to another side of the room, let them know. I'm going to go over here and check your trash, make sure it's emptied. Now, once you're done with them in their room, acknowledge that you're leaving. I'm going to be leaving now. Do you need anything before I go? Now, let's talk about if they need food. So we're all hu we're hungry, right? Okay, we eat three times a day at least. So if they have food, okay, they have a food tray, how are you going to communicate with them to let them know where the, their food is? Do you take their finger and dip it? No, because they still, like, I feel the food, but where is the food? And other things, you don't really want your food in that, your finger in your food. And then thing you can use is the clock. At 12 o'clock, you will see, you will have, I shouldn't say see, you will have mashed potatoes. At two o'clock, you will have your orange juice, so on and so forth. Now, if they're like, what, like, how, like, what if they have never seen a clock in their life? They may have an understanding of a clock. Okay, north, okay, right in front of you in the north end is your mashed potatoes. To your northeast, okay, to your northeast is your orange juice. Does that make sense? Describe where it is. Now we're talking about sensory alterations. They may like some music. Turn some music on, maybe turn the TV on. Maybe that will help because when they lose one sense, the other senses get magnified. So now impaired hearing clients, nursing interventions. So first let's assess them before we even do any interventions. Let's assess them. I need to assess, okay, are they completely deaf? or are they partially deaf? That's what I need to know. If they are partially, do they use a hearing aid? Now, do they have their hearing aids with them? Do they have those assistive devices that they need to help with this deficiency? Now, what about if I'm coming into the room? How am I gonna communicate that I'm coming into the room? You can take a little flashlight and shine it, okay? Specifically says you can take a flashlight and shine in front of them. You can do flip the switch, okay? That might be a little too startling. But if you take a light flashlight and just put it right in front of them, that might be okay. Okay, you have to assess how your patient's doing. You may particularly not like the flashing of the room, but you may like a little flashlight or vice versa. Now also, again with the hearing aid, now it hasn't been cleaned. Okay, that's a big thing. A lot of the hearing aids, they don't get cleaned right. Now, do I submerse it in, in water? Absolutely not. It does not go in water. You just gently clean it, but it never goes into water because you're gonna damage it. Now, where am I gonna sit? How am I gonna face them? Okay, they're in impaired hearing. They can see me fine, but should I go right on the side of them? Like, can you hear me? Do I shout at them? Hey! So you wanna sit right in front of them. Right in front of them, and have them be looking at your mouth. A lot of times they're gonna be mouth reading, okay? That they're looking at your mouth and they're trying to understand what you're saying. So if you're kind of like, so how's your day? They can't understand or get the information because you're blocking their mouth. Always speak slowly and clearly. That does not mean you have to speak so slow because when you were looking at my lips did it make sense a little bit not always have you ever tried like in a quiet maybe you're in church this happens all the time my husband's trying to say something to me and the stuff is going and he's whispering and then he's mouthing the words but he slows it down and i'm like i have no idea what you're saying no idea because you're going too slow so another thing just speak slow slowly and clearly, but don't go too slow, okay? Not like a sloth, but be just speak slowly and clearly. Make sure you have the lowering pitch of your voice. That may actually assist them with hearing you if they're partially deaf. You possibly might need to write down, okay, to um, improve your communication. You might need to write down what you're saying. Um, regular inspection of their ear canals, closed caption televisions are a deal because then they can read them because they can't hear it, but they may really enjoy reading and watching something. We have to promote safety. That's the biggest thing for any patient who has sensory alterations, any type. 
So safety is huge. Another thing is social isolation. That happens pretty largely because we talked a little bit about it in lab is think about you're going through a drive through okay? And, or not even a drive through actually. You are just, you see someone who has a deficiency and maybe they're hard of hearing or maybe they have a vision issue or even someone who speaks a different language. That's not a deficiency, but it's just, they speak something different and you're, it's not a normal, okay, normal thing for you. So what happens? Do you speak a little bit louder? Have you ever noticed that? So when my husband and his family, they speak Spanish, Italian, they do that. Sometimes I feel like I have to shout, like not shout, but I get it louder and louder and louder. So these clients, make sure that you are staying the same, okay? Because they don't, they don't want the extra attention. They want to be accepted. But a lot of times they feel a little isolated. They feel like they're in this little category. Sometimes they might not want to go out to, to the lunchroom because they're the different one, especially for younger, younger people um, or even older adults too. But make sure you're assessing for social isolation because we want to make sure that when they're eating, they're out with their friends, they're socializing. They don't even have to socialize. They don't have to talk. But just sitting there with someone who has just company, just sitting with company is nice, right? It's nice. Haven't you ever been out to dinner and you're just like, we can just sit here. I just want to hang. I just want to hang with you. That's totally fine. So seizures, we're going to talk really briefly about this. Um, it's abrupt onset of disturbance of the electro electrical activity in the brain. So there's two different types. There's the primary generalized and then there's partial. So I'm going to let you guys look into this a little bit more. So again, for assessment, we're going to assess that nursing history. I want to know their history. They're, I'm going to have to do a physical exam. And with these clients who have sensory um, alterations, make sure you are letting them know I'm going to be doing an assessment. So if someone who has impaired hearing, make sure you are writing this down and telling them that you will be doing a physical assessment for X, Y, and Z, and let them know that this is your, this is why you're doing it. Um, know the risk factors for impaired sensory perception. Know what type of risk factors that the client may have. We have to assess their mental status, okay? Now I have to know, are they alert? Um, how's their environment? Is it, how's their internal and external environment? Okay, those are two big ones we need to look at. And do they have a support system or do they, are they alone? Okay, do they have a good support system at home? Um, so some nursing diagnosis. So they could have acute confusion, chronic confusion. Patients who have impaired vision, they could be at risk for dry eye. Impaired memory, unilateral neglect, okay, due to, um, it could be from a stroke, okay, that's a sensory, could be a tactile sensory. So then planning outcomes and evaluating. So examples could be effectively copes with excessive environmental stimuli. They report adequate sleep and rest. So if it's someone who is sensory overload, they're anxious, they're restless, and they're not getting good enough sleep, I would try and set a routine and a plan for them to help them get that adequate sleep and rest. Um, and then same thing with effectively copes with excessive environmental stimuli. That could be the overload. So we met our patient. He's 90 years old. So now I want you to think about this. What strategies would you incorporate in your care for Richard to help treat his sensory deprivation? So think about it. I really want you to think about this. So pause here and think about it. And then what about some safety measures would you do for Richard? So now let's talk about delirium and dementia. Delirium is an acute reversible state of confusion. This could be caused from any sensory alterations, any infection, okay? Older adults, if they get urinary tract infections, they could have, they could have this acute confusion. Once that infection is cleared and it's treated, they're going to be reversed, which is ideal. 
metabolic disturbances. So if they have a low blood sugar or high blood sugar, that could cause a disturbance. Hypoxia, so low blood, um, a low oxygen level in the blood could cause delirium. Medications, there's some medications that maybe it's too high, too low, and that could cause delirium. Now, dementia. Dementia is the chronic progressive deterioration. This is irreversible. It's just caused by physical changes in the brain. It's not associated with changing level of consciousness. Um, and now let's think about what type of interventions, okay, am I going to do for these clients? They're pretty much this kind of the same. What is your number one thing that you're going to do for a client who has acute confusion or chronic confusion? I'm going to make sure they're safe. Okay, how do I make sure they're safe? I'm going to give them a routine. I'm going to make sure that they're going to the bathroom maybe every two hours. I'm going to do my hourly rounding. I'm going to ask them about their pain, position, potty, those three P's we've talked about. Okay, I'm also going to assess their room. Is the room full of clutter? Or if they get out of bed, are they going to fall? I'm going to assess their skin. Okay, make sure that it's uh, clear from any breakdown. Okay. Uh, let's see, what else? We talked about putting them in a routine. They need a routine. So if it's 6 a.m. and it's the start of my shift, guess what's going up? The shades. If it's 6 p.m. and they're like, family tells me, well, they usually go to bed around 7. Okay, they're going to bed. We're going to bed. We're keeping up with that routine. And it's going to be consistent every single day. So again, there's the interventions for those clients that are confused. I'm going to reorient them pretty frequently. Okay, so state their name, date of birth, or I'm sorry, state my name, the day, the date, the time. I'm going to put clocks or calendars in the room, visual clues to the time. Maybe they need a big old calendar just as Monday. Use their own personal belongings. Decorate their room and always maintain that safe environment. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about that safe environment. I know we just did a little bit, but I want you to think, what else can you do to make sure your client is safe? What about if they use assistive devices? Bring those assistive devices closer to them. Educate them on how to use them. Make sure they're using them correctly. Okay, so let's keep going. So with them, communicate clearly and slowly and respond to their feelings. They may feel frustrated. Use gestures. They may help. Now, with these clients that are confused, don't give them five choices. Just give them two. And then promote feelings of security. Now, what do I mean by that? Promotes feelings of security. When they're in that routine, okay, they're not going to feel frustrated or flustered or like, well, what are we doing? What are we doing now? They start having this kind of a clockwork. They, they're, they don't know, but they're starting to understand that, okay, this is my routine. So when it does happen, they don't get frustrated. Um, use alternative therapies. So what do you think? Also start reassuring your clients. Their anxiety is so high. They're nervous. And we got to establish that routine like we talked about. So what if the client is starting to search for her client, or I'm sorry, starting to search for her husband? How would you respond? Would you respond by, he's not here right now, he's fine, keep going? Or would you respond saying, you must miss your husband, tell me more about your husband? Or what if her husband passed away, okay, and she's confused? I want to know more about her husband. That's reassuring her. Um, patients who have altered level of consciousness, so disturbance, continue doing the reality. Again, safety measures is huge. Bed must be in the low position, side rails up, side table. What else do you guys think? We talked about this in class. What else do you think is going to be a safety measure for patients who have altered level of consciousness? Clear the pathway. Non-skid socks. Using their assistive devices. 
Attend to the body systems. Okay, so patients who have altered level of consciousness, they may need more eye care, range of motion every two hours, maybe more skin care, mouth care, um, urinary drainage. So continue to do every two hours. Um, the three Ps, remember? Position, potty, pain. Ask the three Ps and perform the three Ps. Bowel management, nutrition, make sure they're having adequate nutrition. So interventions to do for um, seizures, patients who are at risk for seizures. So what should you do before a seizure event? You have a client that you know has a seizure, his, seizure history. So first, I'm going to pad the bed. Okay, I'm going to put padding on the side rails because if they do have a seizure, I want to prepare for safety. So because when they have that seizure, they may be jerking their head back and forth and I don't want them to injure themselves. During the seizure, you must know what type of movement, jerking, okay, what, what, are, what is the movement that they are performing? Where are their eyes looking? Are they drooling? Are they clenching? Are they shaking? Okay, describe what is occurring. Look at the time as well. When did the seizure start and when did it stop? And during the seizure, so if any medications were given, you need to document this. Documentation is huge. After seizure, they're going to be in this postictal stage. Uh, I'm sorry, postictal phase. This phase is when they're altered. Okay, they just had this. Think of your brain being rattled. That's a seizure. So now the brain needs to rest. So the patient's not going to come to and be like, oh, oh, what happened? It could take minutes. It could take hours. Some clients take days. It all depends on their type of seizure. Okay, and the severity of that seizure. Um, so after the seizure, make sure your client is safe. Okay, so another thing I want to mention during a seizure is put the pulse ox on them. Get their oxygen saturation because during the seizure, there's a possibility that their oxygen is going to drop. You need to intervene. Just put that pulse ox on a finger, the ear, the, the toe, anywhere make sure your client has it on because if your client starts getting hypoxic okay you need to intervene um lifestyle management so for clients who have seizures so encourage them to get enough rest and a healthy diet avoid any alcohol or any drugs when they're taking their seizure medications and make sure that they are actively knowing who their primary care physician is and that they regularly see them and why why should they see them what if they need their medications changed or they need um, their blood drawn repeatedly to see if they're at a therapeutic level with that type of medication? So I'm gonna let you guys do this question, so just pause the video. So again, your book really emphasizes about safe, effective nursing care, which is what we do as nurses. So it's the basis of safe, effective care is thinking, doing, and caring. It's just like ADPI. We're thinking, we're doing our assessment, implementing, we're doing. And when we're doing, we're caring. So an elderly, frail woman is experiencing visual impairment resulting from glaucoma. How might the nurse show care and compassion when communicating with a client in a community setting? I want you to think about this because we've talked about how you would talk to someone. So how would you communicate with this elderly, frail woman. Okay, so here's another one. You are caring for a patient with poorly controlled type 2 diabetes mellitus. What physical complications would you expect her to also experience as a result of impaired sensation to her feet and lower legs? So that's diabetic neuropathy. Okay, if she's having an impaired sensation, it might be diabetic neuropathy. So what other physical complications, okay, would you expect her to experience as a result of impaired sensation?